Speaking of excitement, there's one little squib of tape that I want to play, which is the moment we discussed it earlier, uh, where Gus Walls, uh, the son of Tim Walls, uh, with tears in his eyes, said, that's my dad. Do we have that? Right. With his dad on the stage. You see both Hope <laughs> and Gus dad. Walls. That's my dad. Both Hope and Gus Walls tearing up, uh, seeing their dad up there. Oh, that moment. Um, Joy and Alex, um, am, <laughs> the, is Minnesota it, still going? Uh, yeah, 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 I just say in the words of, in the words of the great Teddy Riley, it ain't over. <laughs> the party's not over. <laughs> they ain't going on. Minnesota's still at it. <laughs> just FYI, guys. That hotel lobby's going to be lit. Ain't hey, no party done. like a Minnesota delegation party. <laughs> can, yeah. I, can I say something about the, the Gus Walls thing? Please. There has been a lot of talk about masculinity and MAGAism trying to own masculinity in the most regressive sort of misogynist way possible. J.D. Vance lecturing everybody on, you know, what a family means, what it means to be a man. Donald Trump obviously has his own version of manhood. To see Tim Walls out there as a man who is just joyfully embracing his role as the vice potential vice president mm. to the woman, the nation's first female president, is an extraordinary thing. But also to see his son weeping for his father in a deeply tender and emotional way. And then the last thing I'll say, because I think this hasn't been talked about enough, to see Democrats champion men as voices on reproductive choice. Yeah. As you saw yesterday, I believe, from Amanda Zarowski's husband tonight, from Tim Walls talking about struggles with infertility. It takes two partners to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And for way too long, this conversation has mm -hmm. been relegated to women or the carriers of, of pregnancies. And it is, I think, way overdue to have men express not only their, their sort of their stake in all this, but also their anguish. And to have a football coach yeah. Talk about the anguish of infertility, I think, opens up a whole new conversation about the, the, the stakes at hand for, for 2024. And, and by the way, and, and I love that you're saying that, because yes. this is about modern masculinity. Yes. Yeah. And in the Democratic Party, the coach that is saying that it was an, it's important for him as the football coach to be the faculty you know, partner for the LGBTQ um, gay club, straight alliance. The gay straight alliance. And he's like, that's something important for me to do because if a coach is doing it, it's going to have just a little more salience, right? And it's going to help kids not get bullied. I mean, I, I, it, what's really been fascinating is to watch the men of the Democratic Party model a kind of masculinity that is simply 21st century masculinity. Speaking of 21st century masculinity, <laughs> how about that? How about that? How about, about, how about, about that? Lead that? in. We got. Okay. Senator oh Cory Booker. I was like, who's going to be? The, the, <laughs> who's going to be? But yeah, we do that. The 21st century man himself. Yeah. Uh, Senator Booker, tonight was your night uh, yes. as, as chairing the events. Yes. Uh, we're talking about this kind of redefinition of masculinity in the wake of a Republican national convention that offered a very reductive vision to the country. What would you make of Coach Walls tonight? You know, there's a deep decency and a kindness about him. And I said this to somebody. It actually is the perfect handoff because the Joe Biden I got to know during the 2020 presidential campaigns, I always say when somebody's nice to you but not nice to the waiter, they're not a nice person. Real talk. And and that is Joe Biden, but I'm telling you, that is Governor Walls too. They're nice to the waiters. Yeah. They are nice to the waiters. They are they they have this love in them that, that you could feel before you hear. I wish America could have seen when he came backstage mm. uh, and was just embraced by all the football guys hanging out there. It was this love huddle, uh, like as a former football player. <laughs> it, it was a love huddle back there. The genuineness of their connection, of their affection. A bunch of guys yeah. huddled up in a love huddle. And I'm telling you, that's what we need in America. We have got to turn the page on the meanness the viciousness, the put-downs, to have a president that will go after you if you're even in his own party. The way he talked about, you know, my friend Chris Christie's weight, the way he talked about Nikki, Her Nikki Haley's heritage, John McCain's military service, DeSantis's height. I mean, come on. Do you expect that from the president of the United States of America? No. Donald Trump is indiscriminate in his viciousness. We need kindness again. We need joy again. We need pragmatic policy making again.
And by the way, one of the lines, and I think probably the, the, the log line for the speech that Tim Walz gave tonight is, we've got something better to offer the American people. It's just such a simple idea. I mean, he kind of reinforced what Bill Clinton did in his speech, in which he did lay out that, and, and I did fact check it, I quickly fact checked it, that in fact, 97.4% of the jobs created since 1989 were created between Clinton, Obama, and Biden. Donald Trump had negative job creation, and uh, Bush and the other, the two Bushes only got like 3%. So, I mean, they're making a case that's like backed by data, yes. but they're also making a case that's backed by vibes. I mean, yes. people yes. in this, everyone felt included, for whether they were a Republican, an independent. Oprah Winfrey got up and said, hey, guys, I'm an independent, and I'm down with this. Yes, yes. And she also has no children as one of oh. these... What? She said we're going to help the childless cat lady well, get we'll, out of the we'll house, rescue too. The we'll cat. rescue the cat. We'll <laughs> rescue the cat. Shout out to cats. <laughs> Shout out to the well, El Gato. I, I think that those folks, by the way, are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> They're cat See what you did there? They're catastic. I, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down there. I'm picking up what you're putting down there. But look, I, I am telling you right now, uh, America has a clear choice, and I'm really hoping that they choose love, kindness, decency. And again, when I, I when I, I the best book I ever have that I won't write is all the mistakes I made in my first year as mayor of the city of Newark. <laughs> and I've been hiring mistakes. I finally learned how to hire the three things I go. It's not your skill first. The first thing I look to hire is your moral compass, your values. Do we have shared values? Then I look at your synergy for my team. Are you going to bring that kind of spirit? Then I get to things like your ideas, your training and all of that. Here are two people that bring a synergy and an energy and bring a, a value system. I do not have to worry about turning on the TV and seeing Harris or Walls right. just demeaning, degrading, being vicious. I still remember that trauma of waking up and seeing what did Donald Trump tweet today? Yeah. What did he say about countries overseas calling them s-hole countries? What did he do about people that were kind on both sides of the aisle? What did he tell people to do about their health issues to inject bleach? Every day it was something different. But with this, I tell you, when I saw Michelle and, and Barack, look, I miss Obama. I miss her husband. I really miss Obama. <laughs> uh, she should have a million been, of them tonight. She, <laughs> she should have been the last speech of the night. I love you, Barack. But she <laughs> should have been the last speech of the, the night. Closer. Yes. But, but when I, it just reminded you of those days right. where, yeah. where we did not have to every single day have a, this this sort of like outrageousness. And the exhaustion from the outrage. Yes. Yeah. And, and I mean, people are over it. I mean, he's, he said, I don't know about you all, but I'm ready to turn the page. I mean, Hakeem Jeffries in his yes. Jay-Z and yes. Jason style, yes. you know, laying out, we broke yes. up with you, it's over. You know, and I do think that people forgot that the politics of nice was actually viable, yes. even though you are the politics. I mean, you're, I, you're shoveling people's yes. like the driveways. But it, and it works, <laughs> and it works, but people are like maybe that works in New Jersey, but not in the country, like has maybe, maybe people just run out of patience well, let me tell you something. the other thing. The, the thing I remember during the Trump years is having high level military leaders. Remember, Trump's secretary of defense isn't out there endorsing nope. and it's the, the, the military people, they know that leaders, real leaders, you hear things like the leaders eat last. They put everybody else first. Leaders, the last person out of danger. There is a honor and a, and, a, and a sacrifice from leaders that you expect, not people that's all about me, only I can see. The best leaders I know in the military build great teams and support them. And so there, there is a lesson in leadership. It's not just about kindness. It's actually about what it takes to create a great organization. We are one nation with one destiny. We need, to, we need to improve our organization, or as John Lewis would say, the beloved community. Who is best? of these candidates to create that beloved community, to create a Team America sense again. Is it Donald Trump or is it Coach Waltz and Kamala Harris? That's that's what I want back in the White House. Senator Booker, it's Rachel I think Maddow. Rachel. It, it is. Can, can you hear me? You have an IFB. Can you hear me, Senator Booker? I hear you loud and clear. Uh, very loud good. and clear. I hear you. I, I have a football question for you. We go we go all the way back to your football days. Um, and I just as a football <laughs> player and as somebody um, who I think is actually very subtle and skilled about talking about not just gender but masculinity and about um, and about heteronormativity and all the all these other things that a lot of other politicians don't want to don't want to go anywhere near. You've been brave about it and strong about it. As somebody
somebody who's lived your life in that part of the way and who knows what that means to people, when they find out you're a varsity football player at Stanford, it means something to a lot of people who otherwise only know you as a politician. What do you think it meant to the country tonight to see those football players in their jerseys, his team, come out on stage to support Coach Walls? Well, all of us that play ball, we've all had amazing coaches that we would literally run through walls for. And we've had bad coaches. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's why I said earlier, what I saw when he came backstage, no cameras, the, the, the realness of the connection he had to his players, the love that they had for him reminded me of my great coaches. And let me tell you something about football that we often, and it's, not, it's, it's inadequate and probably uh, in many ways way too far, but we often compare you know, sports bleeding together, sweating together, fighting together. We often make military illusions, but there's one consistent that is true. When you go through three a days with guys, when you when you get driven to the point of sheer exhaustion, literally watching guys throw up after wind sprints and then having to get back to the line and go again, it strips a lot of you away and you you get to see what guys are really about. And it creates an intimacy on that field and a love and bonds that can't be faked. This is why for me as an ex-ball player, I want a coach that knows that, that lived that, that is that in the White House as part of that team. When I heard that he was a coach and a kind of a coach that said, I'm going to use my footballness to also embrace the LGBTQ community. I'm going to use my footballness to talk about issues that too far and too long have been in the shadows, like IVF. I'm going to use that masculinity that is a privilege in this society to shine a light on people that are left out. This guy is a different kind of guy, the kind of guy that we all know, the kind of guy that we all love and would follow as his, as his players did. But I can't wait for him to be vice president of the United States because when he gets up there and starts talking about issues, like the fact that we as a nation have not done any of the research on things like menopause or, or have a terrible problem with things like maternal mortality, guy like that looking people in the eye and say, hey, we have a real problem still with black women dying in childbirth because we don't listen to them and about their pain. This could be really a kind of epic leader that's going out of his, his what people would put as his sort of brand or cast, mm -hmm. but somebody that truly can talk to all of America. Senator Cory Booker, always a privilege to talk to you under any circumstances anywhere, but particularly tonight, especially because you had a long night on stage tonight, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> Thank you.